Today, we're going to break down and analyze the behavior of the parents of a little fellow named Sebastian Rogers. Craig, what else tell us about the videos we're going to watch? Yeah, so Sebastian Rogers is a 15-year-old missing teen who had, is somewhere on the autism spectrum. We'll learn that from the parents as they talk about it. He was last seen on February 26th. He, he left the house with no shoes, took a flashlight only. When we say left, we don't know how or when or with who or if with who. So we're going to watch this video and work through it. This investigation, this has now become an investigation. It was a massive search for several days. And we're going to look at the parents' first interview on 7 March of 2024. So first, just express, I can't even imagine as a parent what you two are going through. How would you describe the situation right now? How are you coping? <laughs> um... We're on a constant roller coaster ride of helpless and hopeless and many other emotions all in one and it's a never ending roller coaster. It doesn't stop. It won't stop until he walks through the door. I wouldn't wish this on anyone. Not any I know we're about keeping hope alive. I'm sure that's in there somewhere. Oh, yeah. He's gonna Always. Come home. He's going to walk through that door. <laughs> and this street will be flooded again with family and relatives all waiting to hug and love him. And That boy's going to have more friends than he knows <laughs> what to do with when he comes home. <laughs> so. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so let's first off start by talking about there's so much information, disinformation, misinformation out there about this case that what we're going to have to do is rely on what we can see. So what we're not doing is telling you what the facts are any more than we have learned from this channel or that channel. In the beginning, there were people saying that the father was left the night before. Oh, and then there are people who say had been in Memphis for two weeks, a stepfather. So there's a ton of stuff here. And what we're going to do is tell you what we see. Some of you are going to be irritated by it. That's okay. That's part of it. But what I want to start with is saying this guy's a tower crane operator. You know what a tower crane is? It's you climb up a really big ladder and operate a crane. You're moving stuff around over people's heads all the time. So if he's not as flappable, not as shaky, doesn't bother me because I think, okay, here's a guy who does something that's kind of high stress for a living. That part's one thing. But what I am going to do is compare him to him, not him to me or him to Mark or him to Scott or him to Chase. We're going to look at what we see in him and look for deviations. In the beginning, she's doing an adapter that is awfully close to what I usually refer to as transfer, transfer from a true crime workshop, where a person makes himself emotionally unavailable to you by some kind of movement, by too much overwhelming emotion, but she isn't unaffected. She's available, so don't take that out of your mind that just because she's swaying means she's doing something. It means she's comforting self because that release of nervous energy is comforting. There's a clear handoff from her to him, and if you don't think that's a handoff, you're not paying attention to what they're doing. That doesn't mean that she said, if I cry, if I laugh, if I do, you need to do this. It means that he sees that she needs that relief. Could be scripted, don't know. But his language in there is awfully wooden and awkward, which tells me that this is probably when they asked, they were thinking about what are we going to say? He's going to say it's been an emotional roller coaster because the language seems awkward. It doesn't seem accurate or upfront. It's okay because that's what people do. There's also a couple of other little bitty pieces of body language, and I'll then I'll go to something else, let you guys cover the rest. But he does kind of, that's fair, body language when the, he's asked the question that he should have considered about, um, I forget exactly what it is. Oh, yeah. When she says, there's still hope, right? And he's like, well, oh, yeah, there's hope. I should have said that, should have thought of that's what I see in that body language. There is, however, some really interesting body language when they talk about friends and when they talk about a lot of people coming back, he's going to have more friends than he's had in the past. And her lead into that, the stress on that word friends makes me wonder, was there some kind of an altercation about his access to people that she feels guilty for? She feels something about because that comes up pretty strong in both their body language and in her stressing of the body language or of the of the word. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, and uh, to mirror, Greg, uh, we're here to analyze the behavior only of Sebastian's parents. And first and foremost, I want to emphasize that there, 
there's an outpouring of community support for Sebastian. And our focus is solely on understanding the behavioral dynamics of what's going on and how it might contribute to Sebastian's getting back home. So this is not about assigning blame or guilt. So we're just doing a, an opinion here to help in any way that we can. So with this rocking back and forth, I think it's a self-soothing behavior that people very often exhibit when they're under a lot of stress or they're going through some high level of anxiety. It's a way for our body to comfort itself in the absence of external comfort. And then there's a smile uh, when she turns to her husband here. And this is likely disbelief, not some kind of joy or happiness about the moment. This is why we talk about context and when those behaviors occur. Uh, it's so important. And for now, I'm just going to assume it's baseline until I see more with this rocking and stuff. And when when she says he's going to walk through that door, or no, he says this, when he's going to walk through that door, there's a lip pursing behavior right there, which is a little unusual. You see this kind of lip pursing. And this is most often a nonverbal sign of disagreement or disapproval. And it's Sometimes it's like a person's holding back something they don't want to say or they're expressing doubt about what they just said. And they're not looking at each other and they're not responding to each other's statements. And I think this could be a sign that there's no rehearsal, uh, but it could also indicate there's something going on between them, uh, like some emotional drama, which I'm sure there is, especially if it, Sebastian's missing and they're both innocent. And in the videos we've seen like this one, we... Where we do know the outcome, this behavior is more common in people who are uh, innocent. But there could be more to see here, and I think this single behavior doesn't spell anything definitive. I'm not hearing his name mentioned yet, but if I hear minimal mention of a missing person's name, which you've heard us talk about before, and there's no other indicators, like big aisles of indicators that indicate deception. It's just a data point. So I keep that in my back pocket until I see a cluster of behavior. Scott, what do you got? All right. Thanks, man. <clears throat> I agree with you. I, I'm seeing a lot, of, a lot of the same things you guys have seen so far. But right out of the gate, there's a little something with each of them that's, that bothered me a little bit. Like, like we were talking about before, doesn't mean they're innocent, doesn't mean they're guilty. Nothing. I'm just telling you what I see. We're just telling you what we see. He knows he shows no emotion toward her whatsoever. It's a flat effect and no grief, no concern. And he looks really rested. And though she's that rocking she's doing back and forth, we see this throughout all the videos we're going to see today. What we'll look for during this, pay attention to this, this is fascinating the way this works. You'll see them rock in tandem a few times, especially at the beginning of, of the first one to answer. As she's rocking, he'll start rocking with her. So he's matching her rocking. Now, I'm sure like what you were talking about, Chase, the the emotional thing between them is she may have just <clears throat> sealed herself off. She's probably in such a, a big upheaval of of emotion. She She's short with him. You know, he's trying to be cool because she's worried about a kid is what I, what I would think. That's what I took out of that. Her her eyes are red. She's not rested. She looks like she should look. And um, that upheaval emotion that we see, she's suddenly reliving that horror. I always talk about that on here, how, how we're not seeing that. So that's one of the things we're seeing with with someone who we we haven't seen with people who are who aren't innocent. Um, she's got a new Kleenex now. If you remember, we looked we the last person we looked at that had a that was that was crying and all that stuff, constantly wiping their eyes and and doing their nose with the same Kleenex, and it's just this balled up little ball. Hers isn't; it's new. And notice how many times during this these videos she doesn't wipe tears and she and and she doesn't wipe her nose. She only does it a couple of times because those are the times that she needs it. People who are who are faking this usually are under the impression, oh, I should have tears coming out, so I'll keep doing this. And notice when she uses that that Kleenex here at the first, where she just does it on the top of her nose. So I thought that was interesting as well. Not saying she's innocent, not saying she's guilty, but I'm these are just things that I, that I'm noticing. Anyway, and then she's not looking at him at all. Doesn't, doesn't look at him at all, but he does look at her as they're, as they go through. So, all right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, very much the same. Look, there's time has passed since they had, um, I guess, notified the police and this 
um, interview is happening. Maybe as much as, what do you think, Greg, like eight days or something like that? I'm, yeah, eight days. Eight, nine yeah, days, around about that. Yeah. Around about that. Okay, so look, it's time for them to organise a story together if they wanted to. So, yeah, look, they could organise a story together. What they can't organise is the synchronicity of their movement. That that choreography would take a lot of rehearsal. And it's consistent. Uh, she rocks back and forth three times. He breathes in and out. There's this waltz timing going on throughout. You can't rehearse that stuff. They're absolutely in synchronous movement. That would suggest, just as you're saying, Scott, that there is a shared uh, experience, a shared emotion. You know, if, if there wasn't anything shared, it would be very hard to organize that subtle synchronous level of one, one thing movement. one thing i did miss though was that they do look at each other in that one i, I, I for a second there, i thought we we're looking at number two they look at each other for about two and a half seconds on this one so sorry about that sorry to jump sure. in, but i had to make sure i said sure. that sure um they also talk about hope you, you know chase to your point of there are there is some something unsaid you know there's a possibility here of a loss of hope and a sense of hope at the same time, having to balance the two things together, hold those two ideas. You've got to remain hopeful at the same time. You may be losing hope. Uh, so I think they're, they're, they talk about hope, though. Um, there's some some closed lips there from, from the male, from the father. Uh, he uses the idea of that boy rather than, uh, maybe she does as well. Uh, we don't. We're not often throughout this going to hear Sebastian named. Often called that boy. I, I would suggest that's more likely cultural than them uh, trying to uh, yeah. distance themselves. Uh, um, it's, it's more likely a term uh, of endearment. Uh, that's all I got on on that one. Early days, but looks to me pretty good from moment one just on the synchronicity that they have together which is tough to organize that they could have organized a story there that's all i got on that one yeah one thing to add while we're all talking about this and synchronicity and all that is couples get to a certain behavior mark to your point he knows what to expect he knows that how many times she's going to sniffle how many times she's going to cry what she's going to he probably has some of that already in his head from the amount of time they're together and we do it on a subconscious level even at some point and couples are in sync when they're being honest. They fall out of sync during those times when we're mm -hmm. pretending. This, that's one of the things that, that bothered me doing this. As when we first started this, I'd made up my mind. I knew I, I, I had made up my mind about something in this. And I'm just not sure about it at this point. But that's one of the things that, that, that swayed me out of it. One of those tape replays. So first, just express, I can't even imagine as a parent what you two are going through. How would you describe the situation right now? How are you coping? <laughs> um, I... <laughs> We're on a constant roller coaster ride of helpless and hopeless and many other Emotions all in one, and it's a never ending roller coaster. It doesn't stop. It won't stop until he walks through the door. I wouldn't wish this on anyone. Not anyone. I know we're about keeping hope alive. I'm sure that's in there somewhere. Oh, yeah. It's gonna Always. Come home. He's going to walk through that door <laughs> and this street will be flooded again with family and relatives all waiting to hug and love him. And that boy's going to have more friends than he knows what to do with when he comes home. <laughs> so. so, so here we are eight days now searching for him. Walk us through that Sunday night that he went missing. So walk us through, we've got so many people who really want to know, okay, how did this happen? So kind of just walk us through that night. Um, we were out and about that day. We were having a really good weekend. Um, we got home. Uh, everything was pretty normal. He was playing in his room. Um, 
when I told him to go to bed, he did. <laughs> um, he said, good night, Mom, I love you. Um, say good night to his puppies. A um, little bit later, I wound up going to bed, and um, when I woke him up for school, he wasn't there. So in your mind, what, that's usually around what time? Six, when do you normally wake up? Around 6 o'clock? Six. So were you instantly thinking something's wrong, or were you like, he may just be already in the shower? I took a second. Room. I took a second and walked through the house looking for him in case he'd gotten up and was trying to get breakfast or something, because he did that sometimes. Um, about three minutes in, give or take, I was on the phone with my husband. I said, I can't find him. Um, he said, what do you mean you can't find him? I said, he's not in the house. And so at that point, is that when you call 911 or what's going through your mind? She, while well, we were on the phone and I was, I was like, is he on the other side of the bed? We, the normal places he may be in the house, you know, and he wasn't. So I was like, okay, well, hold on a minute. And immediately after that, we called the sheriff's department and made the report. I and ran all over the house, outside, inside. I and looked in every closet. When minutes they were here. They responded within minutes, and here we go. All right, Chase, what do you got? There's one line in here that got to me when I was watching it, and it's, when I woke him up for school, he wasn't there. Uh, reminds me of a sheriff in Texas who said, it'll kill you big enough to die. So, so some strange wording, uh, but it's an outlier. So let's look into it. This could be habit. The way that she speaks and references this action, and this could be uh, indicative of him being present or being there. I'll let you decide if you feel like jumping to something right away. If a lot of people feel good about doing that. At this point in the clip and in the videos, I'm not seeing a typical amount of behavior here that would make me suspicious. And uh, at the eight-day mark, they're still expressing some signs of hopefulness, which is good to see. They're looking at each other more here, as I would want to see. They're more willing to look away from the interviewer and connect during these critical parts of their uh, recollection. And the father, stepfather, is detailing going through a search of the house comfortably with added detail that we'd expect to see in innocent people. And in a case of somebody who's guilty, I would more expect to see that somebody would not want to go backward from the 911 call to add more details. And if you notice, that's what happens here. They go backwards. So he's comfortable doing this. It's a good sign. And when a piece of a story comes out that's rehearsed and false, the story is, it's super hard to go backward. And often you'll see people are more likely to be guilty uh, feeling this internal pressure to continue down the path of what makes them comfortable. And what makes them comfortable is something that they've rehearsed. So the father's using comfortable hand gestures that are timed with his speech. The mother is using her eyes and head comfortably to illustrate searching the house. And uh, earlier we talked about the mother's rocking back and forth and that we need to pay attention to it. This part here is where I wanted to look. And when there's a critical part of a story coming out that's deceptive, this takes up so much mental energy to be deceptive that the body would stop rocking to focus the mind on the story. She keeps rocking through it. And what I'll be looking for from a profiling perspective is when the rocking stops. Blink rate, gestures, facial expressions, and movements are all in line with uh, somebody being truthful and honest. One big thing to notice is that there's no focus in either of them on managing perception and exaggerating the sadness and grief. Those are the two big things we see in just about, I think, maybe 100% of these videos. Manage perception, exaggerate the sadness and the grief. We're not seeing those two big hallmarks. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, when when I asked him to go to bed, he did. And there's a little bit of a uh, an exhale of, of uh, laughter around that. 
Um, so a release of tension around that. My guess is, and I'm speculating here, is you've got uh, a male here uh, re reaching teenage, uh, more testosterone, therefore more obstinate on the spectrum as well. So that can exacerbate um, the, the routines and, and, um, and you know, the sense of risk as well, doing things that are uh, more risky. Obviously, we know that levels of testosterone, as they go up, we see less risk in the world. We'll take more risks the more testosterone that we have going around our our, our body. That's why if you're a male and you, which you, a male will have a propensity on the aggregate to create more testosterone than a female, not every day, but most days, um, if you aggregate all males together. And that's why you will pay more for your driving insurance, especially if you're anywhere between 15 and 23, because you see the world as less risky, the more testosterone you're creating in your body. So just a little behavioral thing there of we've maybe got a, a male here that is seeing less risk in the world. And so it's interesting to the mother that she asks him to do something and he does it. So, uh, you know, um, no blame though, uh, to the child. He's not a runner. He's a good kid. He's not mischievous. You know, often in examples where we do see parents involved in some way or holding back information, there will be some level of blame placed around around the kid. Here we've got no level of, of blame. Uh, look, let's just look at the, the male here. We're not going to see grief in the forehead here because the guy's wearing a cap and he's shaded as well. So we're not seeing some of the areas of the body that we would like to see if we're to see grief, if grief is there at all. I don't know whether it is or not. We may see it in other parts of the face, but we're not going to see it in the forehead here. Uh, I don't know why. There's a deep exhale. I don't know why he walked out that door. Deep exhale there. So there's clearly a pause there before he... Uh, why he walked out the door. What's that about? I don't know. I'm not a mind reader. But clearly there's a pause for thought about the idea of him walking out the door. Is it a pause for thought ab ab about the possibility that he was walked out the door in some way or taken out the door in, in some way? I don't know. But certainly there's, there's a pause. Uh, there's a moment taken there. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, Mark, interesting. You bring up the whole, we can't see his forehead, so we can't tell if there's grief. But I do see something interesting in the beginning. I see a grimace, kind of a grimace in his face and a deep swallow. We usually associate those with really strong negative emotion, usually. Now, it could be something else. But we just came out of the last video and into this one, so it's related to that last question around the kid. So I think it's still there. His blink rate is really low. I think part of that is his baseline. If we watch, he does a flutter occasionally, but... When he gets to when she starts to bring up so many people, I think this is a hot button for him. We'll find out later when she does that. His blank rate jumps. It pulses right through the roof and he goes into internal voices. She's talking and mills his hands. Now, here's where it, people automatically say that means he's lying. Well, for us, it means something's going on in his head. He's milling his hands. We don't know why we can see it. We can't see his hands. We know he's feeling stressed, but there's a missing kid involved. Mark, to your point, we don't know their relationship. We don't know any of that. One interesting and odd part of body language to me that does occur. She says, we had a really good weekend. And he's in down to his left in internal thought and disengaged with his eyes. And then he raises his head and nods yes. Well, if he's not home, how does he know what that was? Or is he just supporting her is the question. So we'll look for a pattern of that, looking for where he's trying to endorse something versus just supporting what she's saying. We really can't tell. And I agree with you, Mark, when the mother laughs about he did go to bed, he's been defiant. Clearly, you can tell that. And here's an interesting one. I have tried to find out whether he was home, whether he was away at this time. She says, I went to bed. I, not we, I. So interesting. That means sounds like he wasn't home. She would have to be very thoughtful and use, use the pronouns if she was going to cover that. And then let's see. <laughs> She's, if you listen to her cadence slow, Chase, I'm with you 100%. We always talk about these guys managing perception. If we go back and look at the the um, uh, Madeline Soto case, the stepfather managing perception, the mother managing perception, none here, none of it. They're just going on about their business. 
And he's using big illustrators when he's telling the details of the story. Bray says larger indicators indicate more likely being um, being honest. And then she uses big illustrators with her face. She's going from outside to inside. So those things are good. All those pieces start to look good. Only a couple of cues. Chase yours. The word pattern shift is weird. I went to wo- to woke and woke him up. And then the one with the endorsing with his head movement or saying, yes, we did have a good week and can't figure out which it is. We'll figure out and watch as we go. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, I, I, the, I woke him up and he wasn't there. Um, I agree. I think that's that's cultural, you know, because people talk like that. And they, I'm from there, you know, not Hendersonville, but from the, the south in this area and spent many years, you know, in that area, know a lot of people in Hendersonville. That's the way that's the way they talk. And uh, so I, I wouldn't think that's any, is there, there's much to that. Maybe. I don't know. But that's the way I'm looking at it. What bothers me about this is he said we called nine one one, and the, the and and then when the sheriff's department uh, showed up, he said they showed up within minutes and here we go. So it's this lateral logic thing where you're presented with some facts, and you assume the dad is home during that, like when all that's happening, where he couldn't possibly be home if she just found out and called him, and then he came, you know, and then when he was in, um, where was he? Uh, we, we found out in Memphis. Georgia yeah, but, but or Memphis. Memphis. But let's also realize just because this is a thing we deal with all the time. If that were the case, Wendy Adelson and that whole thing would not be an issue. You don't have to have proximity to have involvement. So, yeah, I think yeah. it's fair to still look at him as if. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it still makes me wonder when, when I first started this, I was on the impression he was at home that night and then went to Memphis that morning. So I figure maybe he's the last one to see the kid. And I went down this this road of looking at him from an entirely different angle and couldn't believe how relaxed he was. And I thought, this, this is a cold dude, man, because he's he's so relaxed. And so, but there are some things, if you look at it from that angle, you'll say, you know what? I think this guy might, there might be something up here. But if he's been in, in Memphis two weeks, then they don't they don't hold up to that so it could it could go either way but it, anyway back to the lateral logic thing you're given information but there's that one little piece missing you don't get in there and look for that one little piece of information and you accept everything and move on without thinking about it and that's what i had done and i love lateral logic so i can't believe that got by me but uh they do, and this one they don't look at each other or or touch each other either she's leaned back as as a or leaned forward as a a grieving person usually does that's totally normal. He's leaning back a little bit. That's another thing that made me think about him some. But he's probably, you know, he's he's not as emotionally involved in this as she is because it's not his real son. I know that sounds horrible, but there's a, there's a, a big difference there when you're mad at this this. You say you don't get along with the, this kid's father, and may, I don't know how long they, these two have been married. It may not be very long. Maybe he doesn't have a good relationship with the child, you know. So that could be the reason for that. Um, we're not seeing any comparable stress in, you know, on him at all. You know, he looks fairly relaxed, which makes me think he's so relaxed that he's he's not worried about about thinking, I did this, I've got to watch it back to perception management. You know, they're not doing any of that at all. It's like they don't care because if you didn't do it, you shouldn't care. There's no reason no reason to do that. So that's uh that's really interesting. His voice doesn't sound stressed. He doesn't show any upheavals of emotion or, or any emotions at all, really, uh, as, as he goes through this. He does look at her a few times throughout the interview, but she never looks at him outside of the two times that we'll see him look at each other when they go through here. But neither one says has said the child's name yet. Doesn't mean anything. Some, you know, in this situation may not mean anything, but we haven't heard his, his name yet, except from the interviewer. One of those tape replays. So here we are, eight days now searching for him. Walk us through that Sunday night that he went missing. So walk us through. We've got so many people who really want to know, okay, how did this happen? So kind of just walk us through that night. Um, we were out and about that day. We were having a really good weekend. Um, we got home. Uh, everything was pretty normal. He was playing in his room. Um, when I told him to go to bed, he did. <laughs> um, he said, good night, Mom. I love you. Um, Say good night to his puppies. Um, 
a little bit later, I wound up going to bed, and um, when I woke him up for school, he wasn't there. So in your mind, what, that's usually around what time? Six, when do you normally wake up? Around six o'clock? Six. So were you instantly thinking something's wrong, or were you like, he may just be already in the shower? I took a second. And I took a second and walked through the house looking for him in case he'd gotten up and was trying to get breakfast or something, because he did that sometimes. Um, about three minutes in, give or take, I was on the phone with my husband. I said, I can't find him. Um, he said, what do you mean you can't find him? I said, he's not in the house. And so at that point, is that when you call 911 or what's going through your mind? She, while we were on the phone and I was, I was like, is he on the other side of the bed? We, the normal places he may be in the house, you know, and he wasn't. So I was like, okay, well, hold on a minute. And immediately after that, we called the sheriff's department and made the report. I and, ran all over the house, outside, inside. I looked in every closet. When minutes they were here. They responded within minutes, and here we go. So you said you were on the phone with her, so yes, you were not home? No, ma'am. Okay. I was I was at work. I'm a tower crane operator, and I was working in Memphis at the St. Jude Project. So it's, you know, I have an earpiece in that talks to my phone. I have another earpiece in that does the radios. So when she was talking to me, I was like, what? I was confused. We talked about where he could possibly be, and then we went from there and led to calling the cops, and here we are now. And within minutes, there they are at the home. Yes, ma'am. It was rapid fire. They had cars. They, they had cars from here down to the, to the main road, road, as far as I could tell. So what's going through both of your minds? I mean, are we panicking? Is it this, oh, I think he's probably at a neighbor's house, or what are you thinking? My son doesn't run. He's not a runner. He's never run away before. Um, I don't know why. I don't know why he walked out that door. I mean, he's a good kid. He's not, he's not a mischievous child by any means. Um, but there's answers to questions that have no answers, you know, or questions, excuse me, questions with no answers right now that we are searching for desperately. And we just don't have that. Chase, what do you got? One thing I would really expect to see with these questions that are being asked is what we call target locking behavior. And this kind of pairs in with something called confirmation glance. And this one behavior I've seen in somebody who's guilty every time they have this behavior. And it's typically during two super key points here. And the first one is when a super critical question is being asked that can help them to shape their perception a little bit when their innocence can be displayed. Second is during and just after their answer to make sure that the interviewer believes it. And we're not seeing any of this here at all. When she's talking, he is comfortable looking at her. And this is more common in innocent people where guilty people want to do two things. Number one is keep an eye on the interviewer and two, avoid looking like they're influencing or persuading the other person by looking at them. I know it's uh, irrational, but that's what the fight or flight brain believes. The mother and father or stepfather have an equal amount of exasperation with not being able to understand why he's missing. And the mother is comfortable guessing he walked out the door instead of introducing and injecting ambiguity and uncertainty about some course of events. So that's very uh, good. So keep in mind when we see small behaviors like Greg talking about him grabbing his arm just a second ago. One of the reasons we talk about clusters so much, pointing out one behavior in isolation is next to meaningless. We've got to have these little clusters of behavior for anything significant to come out of it. That's all I got here. Scott. All right. 
Um, yeah, I agree. It's, it's this in this video. It's hard not to go over the same stuff. So I try to knock try to knock out a bunch of the same stuff. But Greg, I agree with you. When you when he's scratching his arm, it seems like something's up there. I think all that's happening here is he's trying to find something to say, so he'll have something to say. I don't think he's a a, a big talker when it comes to you know tell us what you think about so and so. I don't think he's one to drone on and on. So I think for each one of these situations, he's just looking for something to say. He's just trying to be involved, trying to say something. Yeah, um, Scott, one thing I would add, I think it's really easy to pick a thing and lock down and not just forget body language, the scratch. The whole point mm -hmm. I was making is that and then he opens up. So there's a difference. It's also the same thing. If why didn't you choose this question instead of that question? Look, people are under stress. They make different decisions. And this is a reason like statement analysis. You've got to be really careful with where you assign words to people based on where they're from and all that kind of stuff. Just a thought. Yeah, yeah I agree. hundred percent. Um and then when he's he's um, he's he's trying to make he's trying to look more concerned than I th I mean, he's very concerned. Don't get me wrong, but he's trying to look concerned. And I'm under the impression that because he looks concerned for a second, then it goes away fairly quickly. Uh, real emotions stick, even though he's he's feeling these emotions. He's not deep deep in it like his wife. And my father always said, if if in a marriage, if one of you is is in the ditch. In other words, one of them is down. So got a lot of stuff going on. You can't get in the ditch with them or you'll both be in the ditch. So he may be one of those guys. It's like trying to stay out of it and trying to be the, the you know, I'm the guy here and I'm going to take care of everything. So that could be the, what we're seeing as well, which I'm tending it, it start starting to look like that a little bit for me, but he doesn't really even answer the question there. It's just, you know, he, he doesn't even answer it. And of course she goes along. So showing the same, emotional transmissions and transmitting the same thing that, that she has been at this point. So nothing's changed much for her. She's just a, you know, the, showing us all the body language of a, of a grieving mother. Try not to repeat stuff you guys just said. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, just, just one thing is that when he was talking about being up in that uh, uh, crane tower uh, early in the morning, receives the, the call, he's got this walkie-talkie in one ear and his phone in the, in the other ear, I kind of thought, wow, that's pretty early. To be working, and then I realised Mrs. Atwood uh, out the back here uh, has she she's got a tower no. block being built be, behind her place, and I can see the, the the crane as we speak, and it's moving around, uh, and that starts as soon as the sun comes up, as soon as the, so I don't know what at what time the guy must climb up that you know in the dark, which wouldn't be a job that I would uh, want to do uh, any day of the week. So, look, often we don't understand the, the working times of other people, what their work is like, uh, and it's very easy if they're doing something which is outside of our scope for us to go, well, that's really odd behaviour, until we look around and go, for their life, it's not odd behaviour at all. That's all I got on that one. Let's have another. I, I have a buddy, check this out, mm -hmm. a buddy named Kyle, and his sister, uh, hang on. His sister, Kira, met uh, one of those guys as he was climbing, uh, going to the tower. She could, right. could see, she could see him from their window and as he climbed the thing. And every day she would see him doing that. Make a long story short, they got married. <laughs> I mean, he'd go up again, done again, all that stuff. And, and she'd see him every day a couple of times. And they got I married. Know, I don't know whether I see the same relationship for Mrs. Atwood and, and, the, <laughs> crane, <laughs> and the crane yeah. driver. Another Atwood incident. One of those tape replays. So you said you were on the phone with her. So yes, you were not home. No, ma'am. Okay. I was I was at work. I'm a tower crane operator, and I was working in Memphis at the St. Jude Project. So it's, you know, I have an earpiece in that talks to my phone. I have another earpiece in that does the radios. So when she was talking to me, it was like, what? I was confused. We talked about where he could possibly be, and then we went from there and led to calling the cops, and here we are now. Within minutes, there they are at the home. Yes, ma'am. It was rapid fire. They had cars. They, they had cars from here down to the, to the main road, road, as far as I could tell. So what's going through both of your minds? I mean, are we panicking? Is it this, oh, I think he's probably at a neighbor's house? Or what are you thinking? My son doesn't run. He's not a runner. He's never run away before. Um, 
I don't know why. I don't know why he walked out that door. I mean, he's a good kid. He's not. He's not a mischievous child by any means. Um, but there's answers to questions that have no answers, you know, or questions. Excuse me, questions with no answers right now that we are searching for desperately, and we just don't have that. Is there anything that happened that day that you think back and that there might have been a reason he was possibly upset or something outside that could have enticed him to go outside? Was there anything that came to mind? We've been combing over that day and even the weeks before he left and I don't, I haven't been able to figure it out. He's, um, that morning he was laughing, he was joking. Everyone we were around that day agreed that he seemed like he was in a good mood. He was behaving. It'd make more sense if we'd been fighting. Or he'd been in trouble, but he hadn't even been in trouble. <laughs> so, I mean, a, a million dollar question, why did he go? And the other million dollar question is how? What about social media? Is there anything that... You know, anyone he could have contacted, I understand he was somewhat of a gamer, or what was he, there was a video game he loved, right? There's Minecraft. A, yeah. He loves Minecraft. Um, the, the game that he has is not online. He has the, the, um, Switch. Um, he's, we don't, because of how social media can be, he doesn't have accessibility to communicate with folks on the internet. On internet. I mean, I we have a firm belief that we just don't feel that right now that he's capable of having that kind of responsibility. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he, his phone is locked down, his computers, his gaming. He doesn't have a gamer tag. He doesn't have online capabilities with games. Um, I mean, we've, it, um, we've combed every electronic. Every electronic. I mean, we've cooperated with all the authorities as far as anything they've asked us to provide. We've provided and still just don't have any answers. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, the million dollar question or the other million dollar question. How? How did he go? And we get quite a cluster of uh, gestures in the face there and, and gestures with the body. We've got kind of a closed lip brown which turns up at one side almost in kind of a contempt kind of kind of way we've got um well certainly it's an as asymmetrical gesture uh, by any stretch hands go out in a in a shrug there's a sideways look on that well so it's quite a shift from what he's done before on how did he go i would suggest what he's saying here is that he feels that's the question how did he how did he get out there? That's key. And I guess at this point, it's moving from a, a search to an investigation. And so I guess he's putting the stress on this. The how needs to be investigated, not the where is he? Uh, where is he? They don't know where. They haven't found him at this point. Uh, we now need to go back and work out how did he leave uh, and it's maybe I would suggest the father is or the stepfather is saying he didn't leave uh, potentially on his own. Or that's a possibility that needs to be looked at. If, if somebody's to think he's guilty of something, that's an interesting place to go. If you're guilty to go, let's investigate this. Let's work out how he left to put stress on that. If I were guilty of something happening in that house, I'd want people to be looking out, 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 not in, not in for stuff. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I agree with you, Mark. It, there's a whole lot of adapting, and when they're asking him any reason, he's feeling awkward, you can tell. But this guy also, if we pay attention to him, most of his eye movement, the entire thing, is going to be down left, where he's... We think of that as internal voice as he's digesting questions and how things are behaving. I don't think it means he's calculating and doing all that. Um, but he's now moving and he's got a heavy internal voice and his respiration's up. I think this is the crux of the matter. What happened to this kid? Where did he go? I think some of what you see in that kind of contempt or twisted face is when they call him a gamer. I think he's thinking, eh, that might be a stretch. He plays mm -hmm. a game and he does this. He doesn't have a tag. 
what would be interesting for me is we all know that people who are on the spectrum, those especially who are really profoundly affected, often can be very good at remembering exact things. I would check the father. He used the word he has no gaming tag. Father may have his own accounts. Kid may have ability to get into that, figure out how to make contact with people in a way that he doesn't understand. So I'd look at all that kind of stuff. Um, but she's certain that this kid left. I'm, she she appears to be certain. Now, we all know that when someone is missing, it's a lot easier to think that they're, they left than they were abducted or somebody did something to them. So it's always a way of holding out hope. Chase, I agree with you earlier with his pursing lips when he was saying he's going to come home. We're going to see a little bit more of that later. I think this guy is a very practical, very pragmatic person in appearance, and maybe that's where he's at. Um, but the dad's then goes to internal and emotion, internal and emotion, as they're starting to say, how did he get out? That's when, Mark, I think you're seeing all that behavior. Like, I, I don't know. How would he get out of here? And I agree. He wouldn't call. Come into my house and look and see if you can find how he got out. That would probably be the last place you want to go. Um, when he does the – here's one thing that you shouldn't do. You shouldn't do. When somebody says, hey, tell me whether you're innocent, and you say – you're cooperating with the police. That doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. And that's the one thing, one of the first things I saw about this in the beginning was a little clip from him on one of the news channels that says, we're cooperating with the police. That immediately gets your ackles up and you go, well, we better go check and find out what's going on with this guy. Scott, what do you got? All right. Yeah. When when talking um, about the father, she says, uh, about the real father, she says he talks to his son on a regular basis. Now, a lot of times you'll see that and go, oh, it's something wrong. But I think the mother and the father, obviously, they're divorced. There's probably a little rift going on there. So she, when she's talking about that, she probably calls him his son. You know, you come get your son. You do that. That could be, it may not be. But I think maybe that's why she's using uh, that instead of saying the child's name. Um, he's adapting with his hands and she's, She's still rocking, and, and he gets in sync with her for a second. But his breath rate goes up, and it's it, it, it's fairly heavy for a second. But because I can't decide that this this one, like I told you before, I'd gone down a whole road. That's that I've got more information. It's like that. There's no road there, and um, his eyes are darting around. So that makes me a little. It puts me a little off there during, for that question there. Then he looks at her again, and she never looks at him. Then he adds another cornball answer to that million-dollar question, and the same thing for the second million-dollar question: What happened, and, and you know, and, and how, where'd he go, and how? My question would be: What happened, and where is he? But you know, you may not think like that along those lines when you're in that position. Um, and where did the like you were saying? What where did the question about cooperating with all the authorities? come into play where do where do we hear that he just threw that in there i didn't see any any place to, to even spark that as he went through so maybe he's you know it, it i don't know maybe he's worried about that i re can't really tell but um his his so far as his innocence has been in question here so why would he add that that makes me suspicious there and then again Toward the end, they start sinking together as they're rocking. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. And uh, when he says it makes it make more sense if we had been fighting, the statement is really revealing. There's a good chance parents who are involved would be far less likely to bring up any mention of fighting or anything negative. They tend to default to pretending that everything was perfect, nothing bad ever happens. The data also mentions him being in trouble, which is also a good indicator that he's genuinely missing here because it's not trying to pretend to be perfect. There's a strong confirmation glance after the mother says the word switch, and she's looking over to him right at that moment when she's talking about the Nintendo machine. This is most likely to see if the reporter or she looks to the reporter to see if the reporter knows even what that is because it's probably still a foreign object to the mom. So she's making sure the reporter knows it. Then they're talking about not having the answers. This is common. They're not introducing finality, complexity, or ambiguity into the situation. There's a huge difference between being at a total loss for what happened and what we've seen in other videos where the parents speak in terms of the case being unsolvable, all resources have been exhausted. Everything that could have been done has already been completed. This is very different than that. 
So their behavior overall is apathetic and sad and not concerned with displaying emotion and managing perception. Those are the two big things that are missing here. There's not a lot of display of emotion, deliberate display, and managing perception. And keep in mind that nothing we say means anybody's innocent. And in all of our videos, people tend to think we're analyzing people or the case, but we aren't. What we're telling you in every video is about the presence or lack of behaviors. So if you hear somebody say anywhere on YouTube that they believe something and they don't and they don't uh, point to the observable behavior into what they're saying, then you're hearing opinion about the person, not the behavior. So keep this in mind if you're watching anybody and ask yourself, do they refer to what they think to specific and something that's actually observable? And y'all talking about him going into the how, I would say in, with him talking to police in 90% of these cases, if you find out the how, that usually leads to where. So that might be some him something he picked up from uh, the detectives. Mark, what do you got? Uh, ben. ben. All right. We've all, I think we're all done. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Oh shit, he's, he's frozen. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Look at him. He looks like he's playing with those games. I'll get him. I'll get him. It's like Space Invaders back from the 80s. Here we go. There he is. And he's back. You're back, Greg. Back. Sorry, man. You're st- oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Oh, wow. Uh, did you see your face, though? <laughs> oh, you didn't see yourself frozen? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> did you hear, did you hear everything that uh, Mark was saying about the British woman? Do what? Uh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you didn't see Chase? Oh, okay. <laughs> did, okay. So you didn't know you were muted this whole time? You're muted. <laughs> Yeah, when the generator turned up, that's why. <laughs> when the generator turned up back on, I hit mute. Oh, dude. Like, Shit, I'm on noise. That was Thinking awesome. Was that was probably <laughs> our longest mute ever. That's, that's a good. good. That's Someone good. has good. beat my record. Yeah, yeah. We're going to have to now that's good. That was tough, create a whole new award. It's going to cost. I, I deserve it. When the generator, when I could hear the generator turning shit off and on, I hit mute because I was like, okay, we don't want all this coming up when it does come back up. And then, yeah. That was great, man. Love it. Love it. Good. Classic. Classic. Histo- history History was made today. That's a good one. Yeah, we need that because yeah. this is a 12th. dark subject. Hats off. 12th of March, 12th of March, 2024. The longest mute ever. Greg Hartley, ladies and gentlemen. At uh, 2.48 p.m. Eastern time. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. God bless. One of those tape replays. Is there anything that happened that day that you think back and that there might have been a reason he was possibly upset or something outside that could have enticed him to go outside was there anything that came to mind we've been combing over that day and even the weeks before he left and i don't i haven't been able to figure it out he's um that morning he was laughing he was joking everyone we were around that day agreed that he seemed like he was in a good mood he was behaving make more sense if we'd been fighting or he'd been in trouble but he hadn't even been in trouble <laughs> so I mean, a, the million dollar question why did he go and the other million dollar question is how what about social media is there anything that you know anyone he could have contacted I understand he was somewhat of a gamer or what was he there was a video game he loved right there's Minecraft. A, yeah. He loves Minecraft. Um, the the game that he has is not online. He has the the um, Switch. Um, he's we don't because of how social media can be. He doesn't have accessibility to communicate with folks 
on the internet. On internet. I mean, I we have a firm belief that we just don't feel it right now. That he's capable of having that kind of responsibility. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, he, his phone is locked down. His computers, his game. He doesn't have a gamer tag. He doesn't have online capabilities with games. Um, I mean, we've, it, um, we've combed every electronic, every electronic. I mean, we've cooperated with all the authorities as far as anything they've asked us to provide. We've provided and still just don't have any answers. Did he have any friends that could have possibly contacted him in some way on his phone? All his friends at school have been questioned to my knowledge and none of them knew anything. So this big question mark, he's vanished. Yes, ma'am. No one can figure out where or why. Um, all right. So let's talk to you about the relationship involved because they're, the biological father is very much involved in Sebastian's life as well. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Very much. Right. Um, and, and how would you describe that relationship, the two of them and the four of you? It's relatively good. I mean, we talk regularly. He talks to his son on a regular basis, sees him on a regular basis. He's involved in school and therapy. And um, I mean, he doesn't have any extracurricular activities, but I can tell you now, if he did, he'd, his dad would be in the front row. <laughs> um, in two different households. And the communication between the three of us is is great. I mean, yes, we're just like every parent. We all have our disagreements, but in the end, we come together as a team and we work and we come up with solutions that as we best see fit. I mean, he's I'm almost in contact with him almost daily. All right, Greg, why don't you go first? Yeah, so this one, I'm only going to cover a couple of things. If we want to talk about the relationship between the family, there's certainly something going on here. But anytime you get a family with a step parent and all that kind of thing, there's going to be some kind of disagreement. But if you don't believe it, he tongue juts when they're talking about how good the relationship is. She uses a qualifier relatively, and she does purse lips. So there's something going on between them. There's some baggage back and forth. It could be around... You know, I, I read that he's pretty stern about the use of the cell phone, and he says that here, says that we don't allow him to use it freely and that kind of thing. There could be disagreement with the father about that, and then you get to this baggage about where per, a child lives. So I'm not going to read anything into it. I'm just going to say you might even get different opinions from the father than you're getting from the stepfather and the mother because that's the way relationships work out. You you, you know, you don't tell me. And then I've recently read that the child was, this Sebastian was supposed to move back in with the father at the beginning of summer. Look, while we're at this, let's stop for just one second and say, do anything you can. Go look at posters of this kid. Push these posters through your social media network. Do anything you can to help people find this kid, whether he's safe or whether he's not safe. Let's get this kid some help right now and do as much as you can. Social media is a powerful tool. Broadcast this across everything you own, and we may actually get some help for this kid. Chase, what do you got? Totally agree. So the stepfather here seems to be eager to grab onto this big question mark question that the reporter brings up uh, of not being able to find where he is. And since we aren't seeing clusters of other behavior, I think this is more likely out of a desire to appear innocent, which keep in mind, you still see an innocent people who logically understand that they're probably a suspect. Then uh, how would you describe his relationship? And talking about the bi- biological father, this is a question from the reporter. There's a strong pronounced tongue jut there. And this indicates disagreement or maybe getting away with something. But I think we're seeing disagreement here uh, more likely. And this isn't spelling out guilt or innocence. And most families have some kind of contention between biological and step parents. Even if it's small, it could show up here uh, with this tongue jut behavior. Again, tongue jut is not a cluster. So as he goes forward to describe this relationship, there's some disagreement and some signs that they don't get along all the time. But not only is that common, he's been openly saying it. He's open about talking about that and pretty open about the relationship being not being perfect. And his blink rate when the biological father is mentioned also goes upward. 
And I would not say that any of this would indicate a likelihood of suspicion or doubt as to his involvement. And uh, I'm glad they're strict on the Internet usage. I wish I had started at a younger age for that. I didn't know how dangerous it was. Scott, what do you got? How old were you when you first got on the Internet then, Chase? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. We remember because we were in the decades old when we got on the internet. I remember yeah. when it started happening, and on the news, they were talking about this thing called the internet, and they would spell out this HTTP, www. And all this whole thing, you had to go to, to get mail from somebody or to go to some site, and you'd go. And it was just it was so archaic. But at the time, I was like, wow, look at all this. You know, and people now have just grown up with it like it's nothing, you know? It's I still have an a AOL. Uh, messenger account with a dial up. Be telling that dude. I remember the first I, ever be email that I sent on CompuServe. Who is it to? To Douglas Adams, writer oh, of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. He put his email address at the end. He wrote the editorial at the end of the first edition of Wired magazine in the UK, and I wrote him a, a, an email going, "Hey Douglas, I've got email. It's really cool." And he wrote back saying, yeah, it's really cool, isn't it? Wow. My first one was to Bootsy Collins. And, <laughs> uh, and and I thought since I had an AOL account, he would have one too. So I sent it to, you know, Bootsy Collins at AOL.com, you know, and some somebody wrote me back. It wasn't him. And I was like, dude, so it wasn't him. <laughs> well, my first one was behind the firewall, Chase. You'll know all those systems. <laughs> yeah. Scott, what do you got? Okay, sorry, man. Yeah, uh, as she as she starts her answer, they start rocking in tandem again. So for a few seconds, so they're locked up. I think emotionally, they're feeling the same thing. Although she looks dramatically different than he does. This happened happened a couple of times already, as we've talked about. So it's it's really interesting to see that happen. It's like again, it's like matching and mirroring. That you do things you're not conscious of uh, that make you look like that person, or you do things with that person that you're not conscious you're doing. So the big uh, when when the, she says the big or he says the big question mark she says the big question mark he's vanished and the mother whispers what? like that I think what's going on there is when like quite often when you get in these traumatic um, situations where it's so much trauma and you hear him say well tell me about whatever and, the, and and years later they go I don't I don't even remember that week of what was happening I don't remember what happened I remember you being there, but I don't remember anything. I think that's where she is now. I think she's so traumatized. She's not going to be able to, to, to remember what this interview doing things like that. That's what that looks like to me. Cause I've seen people like that before or go through that. And then when you talk to them, they say, I don't even remember being there. I don't, I don't know what you're, you know, I remember that, but I don't remember actually being there. I was gone. So I think that's where she is in this, at this point. And then after the second, second question, he, that's when he sticks, he, we see that little, tongue thing come out <clears throat> it's almost like some people do when they're angry so it was it was kind of kind of odd there and then the mother she relays um this positive information about the real father which is cool and then the stepfather relays information that makes him uh gives me impression that they probably butt heads a little bit i think um then he talks about the disagreements with what's happening with sebastian at times but then he explains he gets them worked out. They the parents get them worked out as they see fit. But this this answer, I don't know where this came from. There was nothing asked about that. But then again, I think it goes back to he's just trying to talk to have something to say, to feel like you know, to be a part of it, and to to connect with everybody on that. And another thing that sticks out is that huge micro expression of contempt. When it comes up on that sentence, I'm in contact, in contact with him almost daily. Because just as he starts that, we see it go up like that. And uh, this side of his face go up. And I'll put a quick little screenshot in there because I pulled it out to show you. But something's, at that, that point, something's not right there. I think the something that's not right is, of course, there's competition, you know, between the, the two fathers, you know, the real father and the stepfather. There's going to be a little contention there. And... Uh, so I think that's a, that's what that's about. And remember, excuse me, they, we still haven't heard either one of them say his name yet. No, the only person that said his name is the reporter or the interviewer. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, simply a re reiteration of everything that's been said here. Certainly the, the stepfather here becomes more alert, 
the moment the uh, biological father is is brought up. Um, I think that's reasonable given the politics of the situation here. Uh, it's not it's not irrational to think that that would happen to some degree. Uh, it's, it's it's pronounced here because because we don't see the father do very much anyway. He's not big. Uh, demonstrative with his feelings, so it kind of stands out a little bit here, but it's not out of the ordinary for the situation, I would say. One of those tape replays. Did he have any friends that could have possibly contacted him in some way on his phone? All his friends at school have been questioned to my knowledge and none of them knew anything. So this big question mark. He's vanished. Yes, ma'am. No one can figure out where or why. Um, all right. So let's talk to you about the relationship involved because they're, the biological father is very much involved in Sebastian's life as well. Yes, ma'am. Very much. Right. Um, and, and how would you describe that relationship, the two of them and the four of you? It's relatively good. I mean, we talk regularly. He talks to his son on a regular basis, sees him on a regular basis. He's involved in school and therapy. And um, I mean, he doesn't have any extracurricular activities, but I can tell you now, if he did, he'd, his dad would be in the front row. <laughs> um, I mean, two different households. And the communication between the three of us is is great. I mean, yes, we're just like every parent. We all have our disagreements, but in the end, we come together as a team and we work and we come up with solutions that, as we best see fit. I mean, he's I'm almost in contact with him almost daily. Um, let's talk about Sebastian. Tell me about Sebastian. How would you describe him? Sweet, stubborn. <laughs> Um, he loves to help. He loves, uh, running and he loves to play his games and his fidgets and, um, Uno. Lord, that's one of his favorite games right now. Um, favorite color is green. Um, does he love music? Oh, oh. he loves music. An eclectic taste. I mean, An eclectic. I mean, from... As everybody knows, I the Tiger to Eddie Vedder. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. so we got we got Pearl Jam on one hand, we've got Survivor on the other over here. We've got Taylor Swift, and uh, he's got a big crush on her. <laughs> um, I mean, country rock. No, we don't. Classic. We don't. We don't allow the hip hop. Well, he, he doesn't really. Well, get I say to it anyway. What happens? Things we. You mentioned he loved running. So did he love the outdoors at all? I mean, would something outside that was somewhat outdoorsy be enticing so, to him or pull him outdoors? He loves, like, when, um, when we were in California and the school had this lap thing to gain money. It was a fundraiser. And every year he was, I did this many laps. I did this many laps. I mean, I've got T-shirts where they would ride on his back. Every time the kids went around, they'd mark a mark on the back and they'd keep running and he just had marks all the way across his back um he likes playgrounds um he hates being dirty he don't like being, being dirty yeah he's not a he's not your tomboy style child where he goes outside and plays in the mud he loves animals but he's terrified <laughs> of bugs oh yeah <laughs> Okay. I mean, yeah. even a fly, and he's like, oh! <laughs> All right, Chase, what do you got? Uh, both of them are expressing truthful recall when they're listing all these things that Sebastian likes to do. They speak about him in present tense, like he's still around. This shows us a couple of things. Parents who know the disposition of a deceased child are more likely to accidentally default to past tense when referring to them. And parents who speak in past tense about a child uh, who aren't involved can show that there's a finality to their feelings, like they no longer have faith in the child returning. Uh, so all the expressions here are genuine and unforced. And when they're both 
both of them discussing his likes and dislikes. They're comfortable. All the facial expressions, the gestures, the movements match the syntax and the timing. They speak about all the things in present tense with genuine joy. And parents who are involved with a disappearance, uh, even if they can look back fondly on a child's behaviors, are still having to manage perceptions and maintain deception, which keeps them from being this fluid and unconstrained in their descriptions. So this fear of being discovered mutes and muffles these expressions that you're seeing right here in this video that look very genuine to me, at least. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, the same. Look, very positive comments uh, around the child. Only one negative one, which is about him being stubborn, which is then kind of laughed off, I think, in a in a very natural way um, it, to be positive about him. And, and there's every reason why uh, a, a child on the spectrum uh, reaching uh teenage years is going to become more and more uh, stubborn often in their in their behaviors. Not every child of that nature, not every child, but there is a possibility that uh, this will be a thing for that family uh, at the moment. Um, they get really animated about the uh, Sebastian's love of, of music. Clearly that is a, a joy for them. It's a, um, they're proud. Both of them, they're proud, especially the stepfather, I think, shows that real engagement with uh, with the son uh, around around that music piece. There's clearly they're proud of his love of music and his engagement with the music. And I think the stepfather seems to show some kind of strong relationship with the with the son around that music piece. Not the kind of thing that I would expect from two people who've been involved in some kind of crime around the child. Uh, again, do I know that to be true? No, not what I would expect. So you'd need to give me lots of other evidence for me to see that would show me an alternative to this. Show it to me so I could see it, hear it, touch it. You know, I, it, we want evidence to the contrary, not just possibilities and ideas and imaginations uh, around it. Greg, what do you think? So let's first talk about clusters of behavior. And we always say you need cluster of behavior to indicate deception, but that's not the only thing clusters of behavior can indicate. You have to look for clusters that are positive, clusters that mean something else. Bingo. And there's a great one here. He's all, the stepfather's all locked down. He's in internal voice and his eyes zone out. They go out of focus. That means he's thinking to himself. He's inside his own head working. What's consuming him? We, well, you could automatically assign guilt to that, it, but it doesn't necessarily mean guilt. Uncertainty, other things, we can't tell that. What we can see is a cluster of behavior around to ask about the child. What we would expect, and you both have just hammered this one, but what we would expect from a person who is trying to hide that they know the child is dead is not happy when they think about the weirdness of this kid who has all these, you know, 14 year old kids are mostly weird because they're trying to figure out what being an adult is while they're still a child. And this kid has got a lot of that and they're amused by that. So he comes out of this absorption, this focus, this internal dialogue with a smile when they're talking about him being stubborn. Yeah, he's that. And you see all of that happiness we know that a person who knows someone has passed, if you lose a child, it, you may never get back to the point you think positive things when that child is brought up or when you think about the goofiness of things they did. But you certainly wouldn't be okay with it right now. Good indicator. So clusters can be good or bad. We can see the person consumed by something and it doesn't. he doesn't come out of it into a negative, into a perception management, into one of those tools that we think people who have injured somebody or hurt somebody have. And he uses great illustrators when he's talking about, he loved music here, he loved music here, Pearl Jam to look at that, that all these things together. So all of these pieces and then real smiles as they talk about bugs and his panic when he would see bugs, they're amused by that. All those things are a cluster that usually would indicate that this person's not involved. So I'm gonna call that one out loud and clear. And Mark, to your point, can I be wrong? Sure. I'm not 100% right. If if you think you're 100% right as a body language reader, you have no clue what you're doing. Let's just call that out right here. That's all I got. All right. Should I go? Oh, I thought you'd go. Yeah, go on. 
In that case, no. Scott, do you think you're it always, No, it always seems like I go because I talk first. That's why I'm yeah. last again. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> so I've forgotten. It's okay now. I'll be okay. I mean, you're not so I, just not to reiterate all the stuff you guys went over, not to make it boring. The one thing that I think when he was when they were talking about music and they started talking about, he started saying how he doesn't let him listen to hip hop. And she says, well, he doesn't like that anyway. I think he was just putting that in there. So he, so to show that he, he cares about what he listens to, because I think music is probably important to him. Yeah. You know, because a lot of people think hip hop's not music. Well, it's not his kind of music, but it may be one of those things where he doesn't want that kid out repeating what he said you know, in, in something that's rap, but he may just talk it and get his hand in busted. One of those tape replays. Um, let's talk about Sebastian. Tell me about Sebastian. How would you describe him? Sweet, stubborn. <laughs> um, he loves to help. He loves uh, running and he loves to play his games and his fidgets and um, Uno, Lord, that's one of his favorite games right now. Um, favorite color is green. Um, Does he love music? Oh, God. oh he yeah. loves music. Yeah. An eclectic taste. I mean, An eclectic. I mean, from as everybody knows, Eye of the Tiger to Eddie Vedder. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. so we got we got Pearl Jam on one hand. We've got Survivor on the other over here. We've got Taylor Swift and. Uh, He's got a big crush on her. Um, I mean, country rock. No, we don't. We don't, we don't allow the hip hop. Well, he, he doesn't really well, get into it anyway. Things. We, you mentioned he loved running. So, did he love the outdoors at all? I mean, would something outside that was somewhat outdoorsy be enticing so, to him or? Pull him outdoors? He loves, like, when, um, when we were in California and the school had this lap thing to gain money. It was a fundraiser. And every year he was, I did this many laps. I did this many laps. I mean, I've got T-shirts where they would write on his back. Every time the kids went around, they'd mark a mark on the back and they'd keep running. And he just had marks all the way across his back. Um, he likes playgrounds. Um, he hates being dirty. He don't like being, being dirty. dirty. Yeah, he's not a he's not your tomboy style child where he goes outside and plays in the mud. He loves animals, but he's terrified <laughs> of bugs. Oh yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. I mean, yeah. even a fly, and he's like, oh! <laughs> is Sebastian is able to watch this, and maybe he's watching this as it airs. And if he is, what do you want to say to Sebastian? What do you want him to hear from you right now? Oh, gosh. That we love you so much, and we want you to come home, and you're not in trouble. I guarantee you he is loved. And trust me, the open arms are waiting for him to come home. From every parent to every family member to probably everyone in the community. But there's no malice that we just want our boy home. Bad. Bad. But. That mama's heart. I know it's daddy's too. But I feel like there's always that extra special bond. Can you walk us through what you're thinking right now? I just want my baby to be okay. I don't know where he's at. I don't know where he's at. Let's talk about the community because I want you all to know, even, even my church body, I mean, we're all praying. We're all praying for his safe return quickly. What do you all want to say to the community? Thank you. With everything from the bottom of our hearts, we, I would not have imagined how far this has gotten, but there's no way to repay the gratitude, the love that we have felt from the community, the prayers, but thank you. But from don't the stop of our looking. Yeah, please. My son is somewhere. 
This ain't over until he's home. That's right. Um, I'll go first on this one since I've been going last every time, just about. So, um, she, I think she gives a heartfelt answer. That's coming. That's coming right from the heart. That's a, a mother who's grieving right there. And he doesn't know what to say, so he goes in this cornball thing about the family and open arms and all that. But the thing that bothers me is when he says there's no malice. That's that's lawyer talk. So, and then he tells, uh, and well, I'll, I'll skip that part. Um, so that probably says he's, he's probably said, spent some time in court. Obviously, he has. And then um, and, and when he when, also when he says that for the reason he would be in course in court talking about malice. Makes me think he might have a little bit of a temper on him. But that's, but you know, it's neither here nor there at this point. But it sounds like he's trying to convince the mother that he feels for the child, and then we see that upheaval of emotion on her, and that's that's the thing I always talk about. What's missing from someone who is um, who is innocent? You see that, and I think that was when she closed her eyes and she's rocking back and forth. And, and talking in a real quiet volume. And then it hits her again, that horror of what's going on. And she almost loses it there. She shakes out of it, and then she ends up putting her hand to her mouth. Now, if it had been fake, I think what would have happened was she would have done that and put her hand up to her mouth at the same time. But it was just, it, it was a not even a thought, but it came up after that. I think we almost watched her lose it. I think we were really close on that. So... Um, I, I, I think that's that that's real. But I don't think the dad knows what the word gratitude means by the way he's using it. So I think again that lets me know he's just just talking and adding stuff in there just to to, to have a lot to talk about at, during that. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I think this emotion is real. I'm gonna probably be a little bit of outlier here, but I think the emotion is real. I can't tell you why. I mean, we can assume we understand why, but if it were not real, listen to the interviewer. Now, the interviewer, interestingly, has been using the past tense to describe this kid all throughout the interview because, you know, that's what she does for a living and she's gotten to that point. When the mother comes apart is interesting because they ask the question, if he can hear you. Now, I'm going to assume that that's because she's taking the gravity of the moment, but also assume if you had some part or feel like you had some part, even if it's just guilt, guilt because the kid is gone, you would have that same emotional outburst or emotional release. Because if you think you caused the person to disappear, if you think you did something that caused that kid to, to run away, and then something happens, you would feel a hell of a lot of guilt. So is it guilt? Is it feelings of sadness just from sadness? Can't tell that. What we can see is it's real emotion, heartfelt, feels it, and you can tell it by the person coming there. There's also one on his side that makes me feel a little uncomfortable, not the malice piece. Well, agreed, that probably is something he picked up from someone else. He says, we just want our boy here, but with a big old tongue jut. That's awkward. Now, that could be, Chase, you brought it up early, that he has a feeling of something he's trying to, pro he's trying to project something else, but it's awkward. This is the single most awkward thing in the entire video to me. And it would not be if he just said, we want our home boy, our, our boy home, but if he didn't do the tongue jut, I'd say, okay, just one weird pattern of words because he's had a couple. But I, it just makes me want to lean over and tap him and say, why do you say but? You know, why? Are you losing confidence in the search? I would make it about something else to get him to talk. But look, guys, this is an emotional time for these two people. It doesn't matter what's causing it. But this area, I would focus on those two just to pay attention and listen to their words moving past this. And we will and see if something comes back up to give us some indicator. So far, I've heard things like um, we heard things about friends and we heard things around in trouble, around resistant and spat and so fighting. So there's probably been a, some baggage associated with this that would cause her to feel something. So I'll give her the benefit of the doubt there and say, uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, you're right, Greg. The the but is whatever the weather is certainly a loss of confidence. Uh, you know what that loss of confidence is is about. You know, given that there's a lot of a setup of needing hope, especially at this point, and it could be a loss of confidence around that. I don't know. Could be. It's a speculation that I'm having. Um, okay, so I would say yeah, you're absolutely right. The the mother is is close to not being able to contain 
uh, her emotions anymore. It's affecting the interviewer now. We hear that interviewer's voice change when the interviewer talks about the community. We can hear that interviewer taking on the same rhythm and emotion as the mother. I would say the father has been in cognitive empathy throughout this, and he's now moving to emotional empathy. He's close to joining in with emotional empathy um, uh, for the for the mother, close to having the same emotion. My assumption is he's been playing the role of of strength and and order during this, just as uh, maybe Chase or Scott. I can't remember which of you said. You know, if if both people start taking the role of going down that well of emotion, like th th who you know who's there to to control that. You've got to have. You know, if, if everybody goes down that route, it's complete chaos. Nothing wrong with going down that route, but in a partnership, you kind of need, you know, one partner to 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 hold on to the steering wheel while the other goes down that route and vice versa. Um, you know, who knows what happens with that father, stepfather outside of an interview and what happens with the mother outside of that interviewer. The two roles could 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 change instantly. Here's what I like about what I hear at the end of this. Don't stop looking and the stepfather immediately comes in with please. Well, for somebody, if we're thinking here that this is somebody who's involved in a crime, you'd never jump in immediately with please. You'd hold back with that. You'd wait and see. Uh, this ain't over till he's home and that stress on home. So look, I think for me, from what I see there, from the evidence that I see in this particular um, uh, video, there seems to be quite a conflict here between the, the 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 hope of getting the kid home and a, a reality at eight days in as to as to but you know what's the likelihood at this at this point? Statistics uh, never look good. At, at eight days. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, y'all have some really great points, uh, really insightful points here on this. And I agree, this is what true grief uh, looks like. When the reporter suggests Sa Sebastian's watching, you can see it on her face when she's trying to come up with this. These expressions are almost impossible to fake. But if you're on the other side of the fence and you were thinking of maybe people are really good actors, Hold on for a second. These actors that you're thinking of do several takes. They know the script. They prepare ahead of time for the script. And they prepare the emotions to display. And this reaction was instantaneous on her face in response to a question that she didn't know was coming. So when she says, oh, God, there's the emotional pinnacle of truthful expression and, and genuine grief there. So just imagining him watching is causing this reaction and the thought of being able to speak to him. I've watched a thousand of these things, give or take, and I've never seen a reaction like this in a person who was guilty or involved, never. And when she's saying, I just want my baby to be okay, so often we hear people who are involved saying they want answers. Keep that in mind. They want answers to some of these questions. This woman uh, doesn't care about how people see her, she's not managing her words and, and how she's being perceived. So when you're guilty and you know the disposition of a child, there's plenty of emotional and cognitive room to worry about how to come across. And when it's genuine grief, the desire to manage perception goes out the window. Keep that in mind. You can hear the emotional empathy, uh, Scott, like you point, or whoever that was, in the reporter. And it, you don't hear this in other cases with the reporters, ever. Let's have another. Let's have another. It me around when it comes to the videos. I'll get to the other. Go to what the next doing? one. We're going straight to 11? Go or to we're the doing next. I think we're going yeah, go to 11. 11. Next video. One of those tape replays. Is Sebastian is that able to watch this? And maybe he's watching this as it airs. And if he is, what do you want to say to Sebastian? What do you want him to hear from you right now? Oh, gosh. That we love you so much, and we want you to come home. 
and you're not in trouble. I guarantee you he is loved. And trust me, the open arms are waiting for him to come home. From every parent to every family members to probably everyone in the community. But there's no malice that we just want our boy home. Bad. Bad. But. That mama's heart. I know it's daddy's too. But I feel like there's always that extra special bond. Can you walk us through what you're thinking right now? I just want my baby to be okay. I don't know where he's at. I don't know where he's at. Let's talk about the community because I want you all to know even even my church body, I mean, we're all praying. We're all praying for his safe return quickly. What do you all want to say to the community? Thank you. With everything from the bottom of our hearts, we, I would not have imagined how far this has gotten, but there's no way to repay the gratitude the love that we have felt from the community, the prayers, but thank you. But from don't the stop looking. Yeah, please. My son is somewhere. This ain't over until he's home. What do you want to say to our viewers? Anybody who's watching, we've got a lot of folks in this community and in other counties just throughout the state as well. What do you want to say to them? Help spread the word and keep searching and thank you. And um, just if you think you see him, call him in. Thank all the viewers, everybody that's helped from across the board. I mean, everybody has been tremendous. Call his name. Yeah. He'll answer. And if he doesn't answer, he'll at least, he'll look. Even if he's not being verbal at the moment because he can talk. But sometimes he don't talk. <laughs> um, call his name. Tell him to stay put. He could be on the move, so keep checking our properties. Yes. I, the search is never over until he comes home. That is He's for sure. so smart. But thank you for everything that everybody has done, has volunteered, uh, the continuous efforts. I mean, it, it's... Like I said, this is, I've never seen something to this magnitude before. Our community is amazing. We're all praying, hoping, and searching for Sebastian's safe return for that day. Thank you both for Thank talking you. with me. Okay. Second. There we go. All right, Chase, what do you got? So one thing that all of us look for in every video that we look at is change. How does a person change from one way of behaving to a different way of behaving? In this whole video, we don't see a lot of it. Both of their behaviors are consistent and continuous throughout this whole thing. And here's why this is so important. When you're innocent, behaving like you behave requires almost zero cognitive effort. No one's focusing on their behavior because they don't feel the need to. The camera being present might add a layer of uh, stress here, but that's acceptable. And we can see the difference between that, I promise you. But being consistent through all of this, no matter how much training somebody's had, if you're guilty of something, I would say it's as close to impossible as it gets to fake at this level. And Mark, you're an actor. You've spent your, you've been to all these famous acting schools and stuff. Mm -hmm. Can you help us just to understand like how hard this would be to fake at this level? Here's what makes it really hard is is when you're acting, the audience has to get it. You're communicating. So it can't be muddy. It's got to be a clear, clear communication, which means you can't have lots of things going on in your mind. You've got to have a clear, clear 
through line. And that's what makes um, really good actors, great communicators, but not necessarily supernatural. You know, I mean, you know, they're not, they're not, they don't come across as natural. You go, God, they're a great performer, but that's not what somebody would do in real life. What you're seeing here is real life. It's muddy. It's chaotic. It's some, some of it is, is, is very, very subtle. Some of it's very, very clear. So none of this is like an actor would, would actually do. Uh, I, I would say um, acting is a is an art form, uh, a communication and expression, and what you're seeing there is real life. <laughs> you know, uh, 24 times a well, 30 times on uh, 30 times a second right now. Uh, so uh, so so hard, so hard to to fake. And even good actors, they don't get awards because they were really natural. They get awards because they were very very communicative. Hope that answers your question. Yeah. Chase. Yeah, Perfect. Uh, look, here's what I've got on this one. Uh, she she's got a a clear strategy which is urgent. Call his name, and the father jumps in with yes. Anybody I would suspect who is engaged in a crime in some way would try and put a barrier in the way of this. Like, here's why that won't work, or we've tried that, or you know, they would put in barriers in the way because they. They don't want, somebody who's involved in a crime does not want the evidence to be found and will consciously or unconsciously put barriers in the way there. Uh, and, and look how the mother then acts out the son. If there's any change in baseline, Chase, that's one of our biggest changes in baseline as she kind of takes on that spirit of the son and performs how he would perform in that situation. If she knew that he's not alive, she wouldn't be doing that. You wouldn't perform uh, in 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 that way. That's her taking on that live son in in her mind. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? It's gonna be short and boring, so don't go over what you guys have got over again. Um, we're seeing everything we should see. So, in other words, what you guys are saying is we're seeing everything we should see. It looks real to me. You know, it looks it looks like it should look to me. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, just a few things. Um, a couple of that come out immediately is exactly what you said, Mark. Sometimes it's very muddy. It's not the clear thing that we expect. And add to that guilt. A child is missing. Guarantee you there's guilt. And I don't mean that they're guilty of doing something. I mean, they feel guilt. Imagine yourself. If your dog escapes and gets lost, you feel guilt. Imagine that compounding many times over by an only child and by a child who is reliant on you. So there's going to be some of that. There are two things I'd point out here. One is when she says, call his name, he will, you see something in his face of concern. And I think that face, that concern is maybe often the mother is going to think the child is more communicative than he might think because he was an outsider coming into the child's life. He may be thinking, well, maybe, but you can see something fleet through his face very quickly. It doesn't like like grief or shame or any of that. It just looks like, eh, I'm not sure about that. And then his nostrils flare. If you're about to cry and you're trying to contain emotion, often men will flare their nostrils, Very, uh, especially in the South where people are not maybe as emotionally uh, broadcast as, as some other parts of the country where certain cultures may be more demonstrative. Old South is very contained and you may be seeing that. I just see that I think he is he's close to emotional at the very last thing. So nothing new. That's all I got for this one. One of those tape replays. What do you want to say to our viewers? Anybody who's watching, we've got a lot of folks in this community and in other counties just throughout the state as well. What do you want to say to them? Help spread the word and keep searching and thank you. And um just if you think you see him, call him in. Thank all the viewers, everybody that's helped from across the board. I mean, everybody has been tremendous. Call his name. Yeah. He'll answer, and if he doesn't answer, he'll at least, he'll look, even if he's not being verbal at the moment, because he can talk, but sometimes he don't talk. <laughs> um, call his name. Tell him to stay put. He could be on the move, so keep checking our properties. Yes, like the search is never over until he comes home. That is for sure. So smart. But thank you for everything that everybody has done, has volunteered, 
uh, the continuous efforts. I mean, it's like I said, this is I've never seen something to this magnitude before. Our community is amazing. We're all praying, hoping, and searching for Sebastian's safe return for that day. Thank you both for Thank talking you. with me. Just one more thing. All right, let's throw it around the room and talk about what we think we've seen. Mark, how's it looking to you? Look, I mean, so much of it looks absolutely uh, fine. To, I mean, not fine. There's a kid missing. Nothing fine about that. Uh, but my attention wouldn't be on these two uh, at this point. My attention would be on, can we get some more information from the outside in terms of where... Um, uh, Sebastian might be at the moment. I'm sure we, we'll be able to put a, a link down there. If you see something, if you have some information, uh, you go to that link. Uh, let's put our, our energy there. Certainly that's where I'll put my energy. Chase, what do you think? Yeah. Uh, let's talk about this Nintendo Switch for just a second, I promise. My son is 15, and I we all use these uh, iPhones here, and I put every parental control known to mankind on that phone. The guy that works for my company used to be uh, a manager at an Apple store. He walked me through the whole thing. I didn't screw anything up. And he's like, oh, can I lay with my phone tonight so I can listen to an audio book? Turn the permissions on for Audible. Entire phone unlocked the next morning. Whole thing. I tried it again, unlocked. So let's not discount that this switch could very well be getting on the internet and there's other reasons for him to be on the internet talking to people and stuff. The testosterone is at like an all time high in his life right now. And there's so many apps out there that like self destruct messaging and stuff. So we're uh, praying for him. And I think this video stands as a testament to how differently honest behavior looks. And if you go back and look at it, how wildly different it looks from some of those other videos that we've looked at. And if you have any information about uh, Sebastian, uh, please reach out or any missing person. One call could bring a child back to their family, even if it feels like it's insignificant. And if you have any information about S Sebastian, call 1-800-TBI-FIND. T-B-I-F-I-N-D. Greg? Yeah, let's say that again, 1-800-TBI-FIND. Call that number if you have any contact with this guy. If you see anybody, if you think you've seen him, call because they need every lead they can possibly get. Let's talk about some of the words used in this interview. And I agree with you, Chase. Let's compare this to all the others we've seen where we're laughing. Did you hear us laugh a whole lot in this mm -hmm. one? Actually, it is kind of low-key because we're not laughing. We're not like saying, look at that knucklehead. We're not usually laughing at the case. We're laughing at people's attempt to hide something that they've done. And we're not doing that, if you notice. there's They use the word fighting. They said in trouble. They said resistant. They said spat. They said, you know, stubborn. Didn't like to go outside. What we hear a lot is there's some, likely been some altercation, not angry, fighting, hurting the child. But there's been this disagreement that's been escalating is what you hear. You'll have all the friends he can possibly have. And if you watch this whole video, you'll find the mother talking about friends and about him always wanting friends. So, Chase, I'm with you. If a kid has access, and you said it earlier, uh, Scott, I didn't grow up with all this stuff in my hands, so I don't think about IT things the same way a person who's had that in their hands since they were born does. So kids are a lot smarter at getting out of stuff, and it doesn't matter whether he's on the spectrum somewhere, how he learned to do something you don't know. His memory may be much better than yours. So whether he got access to friends that weren't friends, whether he got access to friends that got him out of the house, we don't know any of that. We can't read minds. We can't tell any of that. What we can see is there's guilt in this mother at places and in the father occasionally, the stepfather occasionally. They don't know how to behave because they've never, helped, never never dealt with this before. And the only time, and we didn't cover this video, the only time we see any animation is around a, a case, around a case for custody in another state by the stepfather. We didn't cover that one. Go watch it for yourself. See what you think. But I think what we have here is a pattern that this kid could have wanted out could have gotten out, and the mother certainly looks like she feels it. Now, last thing I'll say, we aren't expert at reading minds. We don't pretend to read minds. Is it entirely possible that one of these guys is like, sure, but man, they're good if they are. And that's what I'd say. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, I mean, it's it, this woman is a 
you know, a psychopathic genius if she's if she's done this. And this guy, you know, because I, like I said before, I went down the wrong road because I had some information that uh, said one thing and it wasn't true. So I was like, well, this makes sense. It, and everything fell into place. Or, it, but if he if if he's guilty, then he's the coldest guy in the world that's ever walked the earth, man. I mean, this guy, wow. So, you know, who knows? It, it, we, we can't get on and say, oh, they did it or they didn't do it. Those kind of things. We can get all emotional and go, it looks like to me like, and it looks like to me like, and those will make sense. But we're just reading body language. So we got to tell you what we see. All right, fellas. Things another good one, and we'll see you next time. Yep. Just one more thing. So what do you got? <laughs>